my second time to be back here. Um, Instantly, about a couple of years ago, at the same Asian Winter School, which I think happened in Japan, I gave a lecture series at that time on three-dimensional superconforming field theories with the motivation to understand the M2 brain dynamics. Uh, two years after, my interest somehow shifted to the six-dimensional superconforming field theories, and one of the main motivations for studying this kind of field theories, for string theories, is to understand the dynamics of interacting M5 brain theories. So I'll try to explain, yeah. So the six-dimensional superconformal field theories, more abstractly, uh, have been discovered, or I should properly say it has been predicted to be existing from a string theory and M-theory argument in mid-90s, when string duality has been more clearly understood. Um, the predicted six-dimensional superconformal field theory is somewhat surprising from the Lagrangian quantum field theory point of view, because in space-time dimension higher than four, it's extremely difficult to imagine there will be non-trivially interacting quantum field theory at all. But somehow string theory solidly predict, predicts existence, existence. However, from the conventional quantum field theory point of view, it's very hard to develop a microscopic formulation of it, especially even up to nowadays, we don't have a microscopic Lagrangian formulation of it. Neither it's clear whether there should be one. So it's very hard to study in general. However, this quantum field theory is expected to be enjoying very novel or maybe exotic properties from the field theory point of view in the conventional way. And it's, it's expected to be novel for intrinsic reason. I mean, because it's a very novel CFT, a conformal quantum field theory, so understanding it in a proper, properly prob probably will tell us about what quantum field theories could possibly be. This is one intrinsic reason why we, one should be interested in it. And recently, there have been many progress in using this quantum field theory, merely assuming its existence and some properties. One can compactify these six-dimensional CFTs on some internal manifolds to deduce some interesting non-trivial properties of lower dimensional quantum field theories obtain, obtainable from it at low energies. And also, if you're a string theorist, one important motivation for studying it is just trying to understand the M5 brain, which are one of the most basic one of the basic extended objects of M-theory, together with M2 brain. So in the three hours that I have, I'll, I'll divide the lectures into roughly the three parts. The first one, today's lecture, I'll try to describe some basic aspects of this field theory, uh, which has been explored in the early days, uh, from mid-90s to mostly to late 90s, and attempts by various people uh, trying to understand this at least some sector of this superconformal field theory in a microscopic way. And the main kind of approach that I undertake is trying to use the five-dimensional maximal superangular theory, which stays at low energy after you compactify this six-dimensional superconformal field theory along a circle. Quite amazingly, there has been lots of interesting and rigorous studies of this six-dimensional superconformal field theory is observable from this circle compactified five-dimensional young mill theory. So I'll try to explain the basics today. And in the following two lectures, I'll try to explain some concrete non-trivial observables from which we can extract out some physics of the six-dimensional CFT. So there are some, some references which will be important for, I mean, importantly mentioned in my talk. There are lots of important references, but those who are colored in red are somewhat more important, which will be directly mentioned in my talk probably. So there are a group of references in the late 90s, which will be the main focus of today's lecture. And after some long while, I mean, there has been lots of studies on these two zero conformal field theories from various descriptions, like matrix theories and so on, until late 1997, where I find that the number of literature sharply dropped down. I think it's presumably because ADS-CFT have appeared so that people no longer discuss this kind of thing for a long while. And there's a long, I mean, with some notable exceptions, there has been a long time of silence I mean, as for the study of this object, I, and, uh, and, 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 and the really serious studies, reinvestigation of this kind, especially from five-dimensional young mill theory point of view, I think started from uh, 2010 or afterwards. I mean, heavily paying attention to the solitonic sector or non-perturbative sector of five-dimensional young mill theory after some important related technical and conceptual breakthroughs. So these red literatures, if you're interested in uh, are the key literatures that I'll be mentioning in my book. Okay. So, 
So let me start from basic symmetry or kinematic considerations, okay, before getting into any dynamic realization of uh, superconformal field theories. So superconformal super field theories are enjoyed to enjoy, in, in, expected to enjoy very special symmetries by the requirement that super Poincare symmetry of a local quantum field theory uh, combines with the conformal symmetry. And the possible superconformal super symmetry algebra has been completely classified in space-time dimension larger than two by Werner Nam some long time ago. So these superconformal field theories in dimension higher than two are constrained to existing only in dimension three, four, five, and six. And these are the list of symmetries which have manifest realization in terms of quantum field theory so far. Okay? So the most import the important case that we'll be interested in are the six-dimensional ones. And it's, 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 it's having the following, following funny supergroup name, but uh, it, it, it's just having uh, n number of supersymmetries in six dimension, where n can run from one to two. Two supersymmetries are maximal ones, one supersymmetry is the minimal one in six dimension. And the bosonic subalgebra of it is nothing but the familiar conformal, conformal symmetry in six dimension multiplied by some internal symmetry forced by superconformal algebra. It's either SU2 or SO5, depending on how many supersymmetries you have. It's called the R symmetry. Yes. Sorry. Uh, N equals to 1. Yeah, A super, A Poincare supercharge and additional A conformal supercharge. Yeah. A N equals 2 is 16 plus 16. Yeah. yeah. So you can group this number of fermionic generators that you have, 16, or, I mean, 8 plus 8 or 16 plus 16, that's what I just asked, into two groups. Half of them are Poincare supersymmetries. Half of them we call conformal supersymmetries, which is forced to exist once we require to uh, combine the symmetry, super Poincare symmetry and the conformal symmetry. Among many other pro commutational relations, that is quite conventional thing, one important algebra that will be important for us is the commut anti-commutation relation between these two groups of supercharges which gives a linear combination of the dilatation operator, the scale symmetric transformation generator, and the uh, Lorentz transformation in six-dimensional space-time, or in Euclidean case, six-dimensional rotation, and uh, the R symmetry that exists in the theory. Okay? All the supersymmetries are, are forced to be chiral in six dimension. In that, that, in that the six-dimensional chirality matrix acting on this Q and S gives a definite sign, let's say plus one. So we call the case with n equal 2 to be the 2, 0 superconformal super symmetry, emphasizing chirality. And the case with n equal 1, we call it 1, 0 theory. 2, 0 theory, as I'll, illustrate, I'll explain to you in some detail today, has maximal supersymmetry and has been a fairly well, and, and, and admits of good classification of that, I mean, based on some physical requirement. The 1, 0 theory, due to less symmetry constraint, it's much wilder, and, and there are much more possibilities of having non-trivial 1-0 theories. I don't think, I mean, we have some important examples of this 1-0 theories, but I don't think it has been systematically classified. At least, actually classifying this kind of 1-0 theories, which can be engineered by string theory method, are just recently being studied. I mean, there are, these are two important papers I have in mind from last year. So my lecture will be mostly concerning on this maximal superconformal field theories, but some of the techniques could be extended to one zero theories in the new fu near future. Um, um, well, I'll be extensively mentioning about Euclidean theories. I mean, whenever you are doing Euclidean theories, it depends on what kind of problem you want to solve. So without that, the question itself could be somewhat void. I'll explain it in concrete context. I mean, the notion of chirality is becoming very, very unclear. So, yeah, sometimes if you're doing Euclidean physics, you have to double the formula, somehow you don't, and it really depends on your problem. Um, um, it, it's not, super, I mean, let's say six-dimensional Young-Mills theory is non-chiral. It's one-one supersymmetry, but it's non-renormalizable theory. It's free in the infrared, so it's very different from these. On the other hand, these, this is ex expected to be strongly interacting theory. The supersymmetry algebra, not conformal, but supersymmetry algebra, non chiral is, of course, no. No, no, no. This is the only thing. And this is just kin kinematic consideration on possibilities. But in the mid 90s, firstly, Edward Witten has first 
found out a string theory realization of this two-dimensional, six-dimensional CFTs with maximal Cooper symmetry. So his real, I mean, there are two realizations that I would like to emphasize in this talk. But what, first one, which Edward Witten originally found, was to take type to be string theories on a flat space with some OB fold acting on the four-dimensional part. So it's a four-dimensional OB fold taking the form of cone geometry with singularity at the origin of C2. Okay. This OB fold can be uh, uh, some subgroups of SU2 rotating the co complex coordinates Z1 and Z2 as SU2, as a doublet of SU2, and some discrete symmetries which are admit an ADE classification uh, is acted on, in, in, on this background. So Witten has argued that at the tip of the OB fold, some kind of funny tensionless string degrees should be living on it. And if you take a suitable decoupling limit from the 10-dimensional bulk degrees consisting of gravity and strings and handy strings and so on, Witten has argued that there should be existing some, some decoupled <laughs> six-dimensional quantum field theory, conformal field theory, which is roughly speaking describing the dynamics of these tensionless strings localized at the tip of the OB fold. So at the tip of the OB fold, the remaining dimension is 5 plus 1. Perhaps a more intuitive realization, which is more relevant for my motivation, is to realize at least a subclass of these kind of conformal field theories, especially this case with AN type, in an alternative way. Actually, it's dual to the original one. So if you consider M theory and the extended object M5 brains, put N of them together, on the world volume of this N M5 brains, one can also argue that there exists some interacting CFT in six dimension, which is exactly the same as what as part of what Edward Witten has found corresponding to this AN type of fold. So uh, one way to see the, the, some aspects of this theory is to firstly separate these M5 brains along one of the five transverse directions, roughly speaking, going to the Coulomb phase, and investigate some spectrum of the theory here. So firstly, there could be some tension, tensionful strings in the Coulomb phase, which corresponds to having open M5 brains suspended between two, two different M5 brains in the Coulomb phase. Okay? So these open M2 brains can end on M5 brains having a string-like locus, and its tension is proportional to the scalar expectation value, Coulomb VEP. So it gives a tension for string. If you go back to the symmetric phase where all M5 brains are on top of each other, this tension grows to, decreases to zero, and that is exactly the tensionless string which has been mentioned by, found, observed by Witten. So this tensionless string somehow should be the key object in the discussion of this six-dimensional field theory. And uh, these strings are expected to couple in a minimal way with a two-form tensor potential living on the world volume of this M5 frame. Let us get into more details of what I said, just said. I mean, the most interesting case is the field theory living on multiple stacks of M5 frames, which is strongly interacting and which is mysterious and so on. But as a warming up to get a concrete viewpoint on what this field theory should look like, at least in rough sense, it's, it, it, it's instructive to start from Abelian to zero theories, living on a single M5 frame. Then the theory is free, and the, and the free theory consists of the following fields. Okay, so on the, on the single M5 frame, the chiral 2 0 supersymmetry dictates that all the fields are consisting of the following. So it's given by the massless tensor supermultiplet, unlike the Maxwell or Young Mills like gauge theories on D brains. It has a two-form vector potential. And the superpartner fields are suitable fermions and five scalars. These are five scalars probing the five transverse directions in M-theory, transverse the M5 frame. Okay? A novel property dictated by this chiral supersymmetry is that this two-form, having a three-form vector potential, a three-form field strength, should be self-dual in six-dimensional space-time. Okay? So this is a consequence, I mean, the comparative rate in chiral constraints coming from the 2 0 supersymmetry. And this chirality of this three-form field strength living on single M5 frame has a very interesting consequence about the field theory. Can, field theory okay? So for instance, in the Abelian theory, we can have some semi-infinite M2 brains, open M2 brains, again ending on the M5 brains having a string-like locus. Okay? So this is, a, this is not a dynamical object, unlike the previous slide I've shown you in the Coulomb phase, but it's providing some, some definite source some defect sources for this three-form gauge, this three-form field strength. Okay. What? Sorry? It, it should be unstable, yeah. It should be unstable. Yeah, you know, this thing that it's, it's, it's not a stable configuration. 
on the other hand, this is, this, this is a state, well, if it's infinitely stretched, it's a stable configuration. Of course, this is unstable, what I think. If you, even if you have a straight infinite line, if you have both strings ending on it, it's something like I mean, brains and anti-brains, and they can collapse with each other. Yeah. Well, well, these are all giving rise to light degrees of freedom, these massless degrees. These are spiritually included in this part. Massless degrees. You know, the open strings ending on, to having two ends on a single, single D brain, they, the light degrees of freedom are described by the vector potentials engaged in all these. The analog, analogous of that mass lift degrees is this. But they are not charged because it has two ends. I'm going to discuss the consequences of having charged objects. So I'm having only one end. Good. So if you have this semi infinite source, non dynamical source, the self duality of this field strength has a, has a deep consequences on the field theory in the following sense. So since the magnetic and electric free form potential, Fluxes are having, it's required to have the same. It's coupling the coupling of this string to the B mu field in an electrical way and a magnetical way should have the same coupling. Okay? And combined with the Dirac quantization of electric magnetic sources, it implies that the coupling of the background, I mean, defect source, should always come with all the one coupling constant. Okay? So you don't have any tunable coupling constant combined with Dirac quantization and the self duality of this theory. This is a peculiar aspect. Unlike the Young-Mills theory, let's say four dimensions, you won't have no, you won't have any dimensionless coupling parameter. I've discussed this in terms of abelian theory with some defect, I mean non-dynamical non source. But if you go back to the discussion I've given to you in the Coulomb phase, there, could, there should be multiple abelian theory at low energy in the Coulomb phase, coupling to tensionful strings which now become dynamical. So in the non-abelian theory. I mean, this kind of constitution has some implication for the coupling with the dynamical tension for string in the Coulomb phase. So some of the properties that I've mentioned can be uh, more clearly described in the following way, uh, especially the coupling to strings and so on. So by the way, by this way, we call this a self-dual string, okay? coupling to electric and magnetic field strength in, equal, in a similar manner. So one of the basic properties I'm going to emphasize is that the AD classifications of, obtained by Witten in terms of tied to be string theory, I mean, where ADE were purely to classify the OB folds acting on C2, can be understood as some kind of gauge groups underlying this theory. Okay? The meaning of this gauge symmetry is very unclear because we don't really have an explicit Lagrangian realization. But I'll give some indirect, in, indirect signals that there could be some sense in regarding this ADE as a gauge theory. So first of all, we study the moduli space of this theory. Okay? If you have one M5 brain, moduli space by having some expectation value of scalars is just R5, because you have five of them. If you have, if you have non-trivial interacting theory associated with ADE, the locally the moduli space is required to be R5 to some product, where the, rank, where the, where the degree of the product is nothing but the rank of the ADE gauge group, SUN or SO2N or exceptional group. More globally, the moduli space is given by the product of R5 divided by the vial groups of each of ADEs. So vial group is a remnant of the gauge symmetry in the Coulomb phase. So this fact gives you some signal that there should be some sense of regarding this ADE as a gauge group of each, each 60 CFTs which has found. Somewhat more importantly is that it has been shown by various considerations that in the Coulomb branch, the coupling of the self dual three-form flux to the tensionful strings that you obtain by open M2 brains have electric charges exactly classified by the root of the AD, the AD gauge group. This can be seen very easily, uh, for instance, in an intrinsic method by considering this kind of vestimental kind of coupling between the electric charge source and the, okay, so it's, 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 it's defined on the three manifold, which is bounding the world sheet of the self dual strings and given in terms of the flux. And the coefficient here, which takes various values, is the charges for the self dual strings on the various U1s in the Coulomb, Coulomb branch. Okay? So the requirement that the, uh, the gauge symmetry of this tensor field on six dimension doesn't have any anomaly in the presence of the self dual string defect demands that the square of this electric or magnetic charge becomes two. And the Dirac quantization normally, as usual, demands that the 
the norm of these different two charge vectors is becoming integer. Okay? This has been derived by Henningsen in some time. Uh, so combining these two, the charge vectors are required to be in the lattice of the even self your lattice, which is exactly the root, root, root for the AD gauge group. And incidentally, it, these, are, these are the old possibilities realized by type 2B construction by Witten. Okay? So, and finally, compactifying the theory on S1, at low energy, we obtain an effective discretion by phase measure maximal superangular equipped with the AD gauge group. Uh, and in five dimension, you can dualize the three form tensor into two form gauge field. So, so th these are really concrete realization of this theory to AD gauge symmetry. Okay? So there are lots of various sets that we are having some gauge symmetry, non-abelian tensor type gauge symmetries classified by AD gauge group. But unfortunately, without any Lagrangian description, there's no precise notion in, in which notion about this non-abelian tensor gauge theory which I try to roughly motivate you. Oh, 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 so so the M5 frame realization is somewhat limited. So if you realize in type 2B or before, you can realize all the ADEs. The, the case you can realize, cases you can realize with M5 frames is only A and B. M5 frame is UN. If you put that on some Z2 or before, you realize B type. B types are relying on type 2B. So as I tried emphasizing to you, this theory has no continuous parameters. I mean, I gave you some intrinsic reasoning, but really the realization from string theory or M theory doesn't allow you to have any tunable continuous parameter, neither dimensionful nor dimensionless. Dimensionful parameter shouldn't be there because I already said it's conformal field theory. You already see that, in, for instance, in the M theory realization, it doesn't have any dimensionful, dimensionless parameter at all, only 11 dimensional Planck scale. scale. So taking the dimension, decoupling limit living on the six dimensional world volume of M5 planes, you neither have dimensional full nor dimensionless parameters. So it's an isolated conformal field theory at strong coupling, or maybe order one coupling. So not surprisingly, it doesn't have any perturbative approximation with which we can calculate something easily. And not strangely, we don't have any Lagrangian description, at least so far. It's not clear even whether there should be existing Lagrangian or not. Okay. So it makes the study very, very difficult, I mean, in conventional method. But however, some aspects of this theories are very, very interesting, at least to me. I mean, for, for string or M theories, or also as a quantum field theories. Among many of the pro properties, which I already mentioned, an, an important and striking property is, is that if you try to put N M5 brains together and try to count the number of light degrees of freedom in certain sense, you always turn out to get N cubed in large N limits, contrary to the N square scaling degrees that you find in conventional gauge, in young Mills type gauge theories. This has been verified by various methods, like anomaly cancellation of certain sorts, or some calculation of black rain entropy on the gravity side. If you put large number of black grains and give temperature, and let them back react to the background geometry. Okay? All the coefficients are n cubed, alluding to the fact that light degrees of freedom, number of them stays like n cubed. Well, it should be zero. Entropy density is zero. It's just, yeah, it's just having ADS7. Well, well, yeah, yeah. In a conformal field theory, the power of T is dictated by conformal symmetry as well. So it's T5, T5 power. So, I mean, the co even if the coefficient is n cubed, if T is zero, it's n cubed times zero. So you, you see nothing, at least from this perspective. But from different methods, you see different indications of the appearance of n cubed. For instance, like the anomaly calculations in you know, some curved background, or yeah, so on. So it has been, discussion has been very indirect, but it has been emphasized since 1996 by various people, especially Cyborg, that despite the absence of concrete Lagrangian description, uh, this kind of system has been emphasized to, uh, emphasized to be exhibiting various basic properties which we expect to be satisfied for relativistic quantum field theories, such as localities and so on. So it's somehow, natural to classify this as a local quantum field theory with relativistic symmetry. Okay? But with the absence of concrete description, the claim somewhat sounds inconcrete. So this gives me a concrete motivation 
to understand this quantum field theory better. And, and this should probably let us know what quantum field theory is in a more profound way, I think. Okay. So, I, I try to explain some basic aspects concerning the discovery of this theory in the early days. If there are any questions concerning what I've said so far? In the next 10 minutes or something, I'll try to explain uh, various earlier attempts to microscopically understand some aspects of this six-dimensional six dimensional theory. Since you don't have a manifestly relativistic uh, Lagrangian description for it, although you don't have a microscopic relativistic description for it for this full theory, there are various descriptions which try to construct a consistent quantum theory, uh, which, which sometimes describes some subsector of it, which sometimes break the manifest symmetry and try to discretize the theory, dis try to provide a discretized description of the theory, and so on. So I'll try to explain a couple of examples. And eventually, uh, the goal is to emphasize the central role played by the five-dimensional super Yagner's theory, which is the central object that I'm going to study in this, throughout this lecture series. The first description that I'm going to explain to you in, in briefly, closely related to five-dimensional Young Mills that I'm going to explain to you later, is what is called the, uh, the, the discrete Lycon quantization description of this M5 frame. It has been done, explored in the, I think the 1990s by these two papers and following works. And the basic idea is to take uh, one time and one spatial direction in this six-dimensional space-time and form the following null coordinates. If you compactify one of the two null coordinates with finite null radius and regard the remaining direction as a time, uh, you are getting what is called a DLCQ description, I, whose precise sense I will be explaining to you as the following. Uh, and this kind of description is supposed to describe a subsector of, uh, of the underlying theory in a very special scaling limit. So the theory in this null compactified circle has been interpreted to give the following, following physical setting by Sen and Cyborg in 1997 within the general context of DLCQ of M theory. So uh, it has been argued or explained that compactifying the theory on a null circle can be described as a limiting process of first compactifying the theory on a spatial circle of radius r, let's say on this x1, and taking the limit of, taking the limit of, uh, taking this, take the limit of extending this radius to zero, and simultaneously describing the system in a large boosted frame, okay? So that the, the compactification circle becomes approximately, I mean, asymptotically null with finite radius, okay? So more concretely, if you're interested in describing the sector of this, this underlying theory, in which you have k, Kaluza, k units of kaluza klein momentum along this small spatial circle, you, uh, you take the scaling limit in which the radius is sent to zero, but the interest energy of your interest is kept to be finite, okay? So the, the kaluza klein momentum state mass is scaling inversely proportional to R, so they're gonna provide very heavy rest masses for this kaluza klein particle. But since the energy excitations beyond that rest mass of your interest is kept finite, you get a system in which the velocity is much less than the rest mass. So the DLCQ description eventually ends up giving some non-relativistic quantum, quantum mechanical system for this kaluza klein momentum, okay? And it's not difficult to to write down with this interpretation what kind of quantum mechanical system it should be. Okay? It's nothing but the D0 brain quantum mechanics, because in M, M theory, in the circle compactification, has its, this, has its kaluza klein momentum described by non-perturbative D0 brain particles. Since we are excited, since we are interested in the, in, in the kaluza klein momentum degrees of freedom living on this six-dimensional M5 brain theory, you consider the D0 brain dynamic bound to the circle reduction of M5 brain, which is nothing but the D4 brain. So you have stacks of D4 brains, you have stacks of D0 brains, whose number is equal to the kaluza klein momenta, and you investigate the low energy dynamics of these this strings, which is described by some kind of matrix quantum mechanics. Okay? So there are nine matrix value scalar degrees of freedom, because there are nine spatial directions in type space string theory, which are all taking values of K by K matrix. So five of them transfer to the D4, D0, D4 brains direction is denoted by phi I, Four of them, which correspond to the of D0 brains along this D4, are called AM. Sorry for this clumsy notation, but somehow, yeah, there are many fields, so it's a bit complicated. Yeah. And the rest of the degrees of freedom comes from the D4, D0 strings, which comes in all K by N matrix. So this is denoted by Q with some internal symmetry index, some extra symmetry indices. Okay? 
So this system is a matrix quantum mechanics for the D0, D4 strings. But this is not the eventual situation that we want to study, because it has some D0 brains which moves away from D4 brains. So it's an interacting system of the bulk D0 brains and the D0 brains stuck to the D4 brains. It's not purely a six-dimensional system. So decouple out this nine-dimensional bulk, bulk particles of consisting of D4 brains, D0 brains. You have to take a suitable limit in which you take the bulk Planck function to be zero, so that the bulk and boundary degrees are not interacting. In terms of quantum mechanics, it turns out to sending the, the gauge coupling constant of this quantum mechanical system to infinity. So eventually, you're required to do some strong coupling calculation here as well, even though you have a microscopic Lagrange. Yes. Uh, actually, this, uh, this is one of the very subtle aspects of DLCQ, because um, in generic situations, for DLCQ in various different dimensional brains, I mean, these D4, D4 modes are corresponding D brain, D brain modes, having the perturbative degrees of freedom. They are light degrees having zero momentum. And, and I, br I briefly recall that in the early days, that treating these zero modes are very important, because if you start from Young Mills theory in, let's say, four dimensions or something, if you compactify that with lower dimensions, the lower dimensional perturbative degrees of freedom are strongly interacting, it becomes subtle. And it has been suggested some time ago that to do the correct direct DLCQ distribution, you have to know how the integrating out effect of these perturbative degrees of freedom carefully. But the safer situation here is that five-dimensional Young Mills is weakly coupled in this variable, so the effect of these D4D4 modes are relatively minor. So it's just decoupling out. It's the speciality of this technique. Yeah, the theory is difficult, but the LCQ is somewhat simplified in some sense. And the second kind of description I'd like to briefly mention, I mean, you know, eventually to get to the five-dimensional Young Mills of my interest, is what is called the deconstruction description of so suitable compactified 2-0 theory. It has been proposed by Akani Hamed and companies in 2001. And the rough idea is the following. So you, in this situation, you are interested in the 2-0 theory, compactified on a torus. So the geometry is nothing but, I mean, the simplest thing is this, R4, or you, Minkowski one, times T2, which has two radii. So the idea is, the following, since it's very difficult to define a continuum theory living on this manifold, you try to somehow discretize the degrees of freedom living here, something like lattice-sizing the degrees of freedom, and try to describe the regular lattice-sized system in terms of many, many four-dimensional fields living on this R4 part. Okay? So, so by taking the limit in which you take the number of fields to be sufficiently large and other suitable scaling limits, you are expecting yourself to recover the continuum theory in a very special scaling limit. The concrete theory that this Akani Hamad and company propose are the following things. If you are somehow discretizing or deconstructing this T2 part of the degrees of freedom into K degrees of freedom, in a certain sense I'll explain to you precisely, the system they propose is, to, is the four-dimensional somehow supersymmetric quantum field theory consisting of K number of UN vector fields enjoying some n equal two supersymmetry. And to correctly realize this, this kind of deconstruction, they, they, they position, I mean, in, in the, in the schematic, I mean, just, just pictorially, they put these n circles to denote this n vector multiplet and in, insert various kinds of hypermultiplets uh, uh, connecting, I mean, which are bifundamental with respect to the adjacent un vector multiplet fields. So this system is conveniently described by what is called the circular fiber diagram. You have U n vector multiplet and, and, and bifundamental hypermultiplets connecting all these adjacent, so forming a circular quiver. And this theory is supposed to be describing the continuum theory in the very special limit I'm going to describe now. So what they propose to do is to Higgs this theory by giving a very special kind of web to this vacuum expectation value to this bifundamental hypermultiplet. Okay? So many of the degrees of freedom will become massive. And actually, in the, in the limit where the number of fields is taken to be large, it gives you an infinite tower of massive states. These massive states are identified with the kaluza klein interpreted as kaluza klein mode along this T2. Okay? To realize the theory with finite radii of T2, you take the scaling limit of taking the number of fields to be infinity, going back to continuum, and uh, you take the Higgs expectation value to infinity and the four-dimensional gauge coupling to infinity, and take the following two dimensional dimension of length quantity to be finite in the scaling limit. Okay? So 
these two radii are corresponding to the radii of the two circular torus. Okay? So if you Higgs this four-dimensional theory, and if your interest of the energy of your interest is much lower than this symmetry breaking scale at this scale, this theory is supposed, supposed to describe a continuum theory of two zero theory living on alpha times CT. A simple way to motivate this is to start from a five dimensional Young Mills obtained by circle compactification of this theory. So you take one circle to be very small, you obtain, obtain five dimensional maximal super Young Mills theory living on R4 times S1. You first try to deconstruct or discretize this theory, the classical Lagrangian. So the way you do it concretely is the following. So you take the circle direction, the five dimensional gauge fields are all living on them, you divide it into steps. So the length of the step is A, which will be taken to be small, the number of steps is K. So A times K is two pi over radius of the fifth circle. Okay? And you, instead of introducing continuum fields here, you introduce a field which is defined in each interval by A running from one to K. So all the differential operators in the continuum theory is replaced by difference of difference operators and laterally leading to the four dimensional field. You can completely show that this discretized super young mills is nothing but the Higgs version of this four dimensional pivot gate theory here. A somewhat surprising proposal is trying to discretize or deconstruct the five dimensional super young mills, which is in any sense nothing but the lower low, low energy effective field theory of circle compactified six dimensional theory, is supposed or proposed to provide a complete description of the torus compactified six dimensional theory. This has to do with a key property of maximal superiority that I'm going to explain to you. Please, yeah, please. Uh huh. Yes. 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 Ah, oh, so, so roughly speaking, this small a is corresponding to the discretized position for mm -hmm. And in order to get to the fields which are, which, which are depicted here, you have to do a discrete Fourier transformation on this lattice. And then you get this field. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. 4D description, this 4D super conformal field description in the Higgs space. <laughs> yeah, this has been, uh, yeah. So all of the description I've said to you, said, told you, especially explored by people in the early days, have to do with some crucial properties of five-dimensional super young mills, as I'll explain to you in the next slide. So the first, first of all, I have to explain the peculiar aspect of five-dimensional super young mills, which is underlying in the various descriptions I explained to you. Okay? So five-dimensional super young mills, roughly speaking, living on D4 brains for the UN gauge theory, is obtained by compactifying the two-zero theory on a circle and take the circle radius to be small compared to the energy of your interest, and at the low energy, you get five-dimensional super young mills, which appears to be non-renormalizable. Okay? But this low energy effective description, somewhat surprisingly, remembers much more than what we expect for low energy effective theories. So apparently, we expect that we discarded lots of circle, Kaluza Klein momentum degrees along this compactification, or a compactified circle. But the five-dimensional young mills theory is secretly remembering you apparently forgot Kaluza Klein degrees in its solitonic sector. Okay? So these solitons in five dimensional setting is, is somehow finally called instantons for historical reasons. So instantons are, I mean, as its name suggests, it's, it's, it's giving you some similar process in some field theory. For, so for, so for in Euclidean Young Mills gauge theory in four dimensions, it's a non abelian field strength satisfying one of the two equations, two differential equations. And that solution of that gives rise to some finite action solutions, uh, which mediate some tunneling of the Young Mills theory vacuum. Okay? But if you uplift this four dimensional solution up to five, R4 plus one, it's giving you some stationary profile of, of particle-like configuration whose energy densities are localized around a certain point. Okay? So it's giving you some solitonic particle-like configuration in five dimensions. So the main instanton is somewhat mis misleading but it's a particle-like configuration. So it's easy, easy to understand that in the, some basic aspects of it by considering the energy function of this Young Mills theory, try to complete square it into the following combination, and the rest becomes a topological quantity, topologically conserved charge. 
So imposing this BPS, this equation for the young Mersenne centron, you get a, you saturate the lower bound for, in the topological sector for the energy, or the mass, where the right hand side is giving rise to the mass of the incentral particle, inversely proportional to the coupling constant. Okay. So it's naturally using the deep type 2 AN uh, relation between type 2 AN M series correspondence realized on D4 brains. These incentral particles are nothing but D0 brains forming a bound with the D4 brain part, D4 brains. Okay. So it turns out that the extra energy which is given to the D0 brains, it's just proportional to the D0 brains individual energy, proportional to one of a colossal client surface radius. So it's really giving rise to a marginal bound state or threshold bound state between D0 and D4, meaning that there's no negative binding energy on top of the rest energies of D4 and D0 brains. So this makes the five dimensional superangular somewhat interesting because uh, this theory is somehow in the solitonic, in a non perturbative way, is seeing the apparently lost UV degrees of freedom is the five year theory. Okay? So, confronting the fact that this theory is non renormalizable, you can understand all the previous approaches in the past as trying to give precise sense to the usage of five dimensional super young males. Okay? So, so, the deconstruction is obviously coming this way because it tries to discretize the five dimensional super young males on a circle. And the way that this five-dimensional deconstruction gives rise to the deconstruction of two-zero theory is that the four-dimensional field theory that I mentioned also has some solitonic objects corresponding to five-dimensional instantons, which makes it possible to see the apparently invisible six-dimensional colossal client degrees. Okay? So the magic of this instanton soliton is in a deformed way present in this four-dimensional superconformed field theory as well. And the DLCQ description can be viewed as nothing but the quantum mechanical description of these D0 brains. And, and in suitable sense, this is nothing but the, the quantum mechanical description of these instanton particles in a suitable scaling limit that I'm going to explain to you. So everything is relying, I mean, it's closely connected to the 5D super young mirrors theory's uh, novel property that instanton solitons are seeing the colossal climb mode. The problem is whether we can make this observation quantum mechanically precise because the five-dimensional theory itself is non-renormalizable, at least it appears. Okay. Yeah. Please. Basically, based on this observation, some great people like Mike Douglas, Lambert, and his collaborators even have considered the possibility of five-dimensional maximal super young males being a consistent theory, which is, as far as I'm aware of, in a very wild status, I think. So what is the correct meaning of this five-dimensional maximal super young males? I think should be highly unclear at the moment. Well, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Well, well, well the 5D theory with a suitable UV completion is by definition the six-dimensional theory, but that may be saying something tautological. But, but yeah, this four-dimensional theory I discussed is even more UV deformation on top of the six-dimensional theory, and upon doing some algae fluidic phase, you're supposed to reconstruct the six-dimensional theory. So it's an even more complicated setting. Yeah, I mean, if time permits, after showing you some concrete empirical results that we we got up to nowadays, I may have time to briefly come back to possible interpretations how to take this five-dimensional young males. But mostly I try to assume it as a low energy effective theory and try to go as safe a approach as possible. Okay? In any way, the question that has been raised by many people, or including myself I should say, is that whether we can use, I mean, setting aside this conceptual issue, whether we can usefully take advantage of this five young males description to get, learn, out, learn something important and interesting about the six-dimensional theory. To directly work with five-dimensional theory, there are two different, difficult aspects. I mean, you're interested, say, in certain observables. You write down path integral expressions for it. It's generally, it's expected to be ill-defined, plaguing, suffering from UV divergence problems, and so on. And even if you suppose that you've written down some quantity which formally makes sense, free of divergence issues, so on, another technical difficulty is that you have to calculate it, especially at strong coupling. The strong coupling regime is interesting because that's the, direct, this, that's the region where the extra six-dimensional circle size opens up, 
And that's the region where the exciting sixth dimensional physics is expected to show up. So doing a strong coupling calculation is another technical difficulty. I mean, something like writing down QCD doesn't guarantee you to explicitly calculate all the low energy spectrums and so on. So there are two levels of difficulties which you, if you try to directly use maximal Fukuyama mirrors. So, um, if you interpret five dimensional observable as six dimensional observables, let's say on C2, I mean, if you consider the circle compacted by five dimensional theory, and if, and if the observable uplifts to six dimensional observables on T2, then, it, then sometimes it shows up a six dimensional SVLT, I mean, SVLT on a torus. It's actually a realization of SVLT of maximal superangulars in four dimensions. So there are a lot of questions of whether four dimensional observables are uplifting to natural geometric six dimensional observables if you go up one higher dimension and thus by two dimension improving in some sense. So, it, it, I mean, but in generic setting, there's no notion of five dimensional geometry. Only in the setting which has connection with four-dimensional maximum Very good question. Okay. So, so, so the attitude that I'm, the, the the point that I'm trying to emphasize from now on is that if you try to choose a very special subset of observables, even from naive super five D superangular theory, which has some association with certain supersymmetries, okay, then I'm going to try to explain to you that two kinds of difficulties can, in some sense, be circumvented. In the following way, um, I can I, I can skip this. So, so BPS observables are say partition functions or expectation values of non-trivial operators, which whose expressions are commuting with at least some set of supercharges of the underlying theory. Okay, and supersymmetry is so powerful in in controlling the quantum corrections, quantum fluctuations of the theory by giving us a Bose Fermi cancellation pairing and cancellations of the path integral. So, so, so the supersymmetric observables in supersymmetric theories plays very important roles, especially in this five-dimensional superior mirrors. It plays two dual roles. First of all, a priori, I mean, the general path integrals that you can write down for various observables is not guaranteed to be well-defined at all in non-renormalizable theories if you're suffering from UV divergences and so on. However, if you are interested in a certain supersymmetric path integral, these path integrals are extremely special ones. In order, I mean, in that its measure, are, measure is all commuting with certain set of supercharges. If that kind of thing happens, the general, generally very dangerous fluctuation between the bosons and fermionic modes cancel with each other in a severe way, especially in the UV region. Please, I mean, it's actually always formally guarantees that the supersymmetric path integrals are well-defined free of UV divergence issues even normalizable theories, okay? Which I'll try, this point I'll try to uh, elaborate on with concrete examples in the next two lectures. So even with non-renormalizable theories, there are observables that you can concretely define free of UV divergence issues if you restrict yourself to supersymmetric observables. This is, of course, a severe restriction in the space of all the observables that exist in the, in, in your, in the theory, let's say the true zero theory, but but recent discovery, uh, realization in the past few years, is that even within this subset of supersymmetric partition functions or observables, you can get a lot of non-trivial information. So in the very old days, I mean, calculating BPS of also observables almost always means going to the theory and doing the calculation and relying on some non-renormalization arguments and so on. So basically, knowing three theory gives some, trivially gives some interest to theories information. The recent techniques developed to evaluate the supersymmetric path integrals in a more refined way have supersymmetries strongly constraining your observable, but still you get some functions non-trivially depending on the coupling constant. So it's really sensitive to the details of interaction, so it's much more non-trivial than you might likely think. The second role is that having written down this expression, supersymmetry let us let you to evaluate this exactly at general value of coupling constant. So the most important observables that I'll be interested in in this talk is the partition function of this five-dimensional young mills or two zero theory on various curve manifolds. You have various parameters for the geometry. And then the partition function that you're going to calculate will be a function of G young mills. But since it has a dimension of length, it should be combined with various length scales of your curve geometry. So calling this R the characteristic 
length scale of the manifold of your interest, you're going to get some non-trivial function which depends on the dimensionless combination of coupling constants with other parameters, which tells you the dynamical information of this theory, eventually the six-dimensional CFT. Literal, I mean, I mean, you put the manifold on suitable curved space. I mean, we took the theory, let's say well, on S5 or R4 cross S1, you always have an extra length scale. Otherwise, you'll get a boring quantity because there's no dimensionless parameter. And interpreting this as the radius parameter of the sixth circle, you're going to give, extract out some non-trivial information of the six-dimensional theory. And the role of instant of solitary factors will be very important for having this non-trivial dependence. So this gives, I mean, especially, however, especially for the first aspect, it's highly non clear what the status is. Whether the calculation is working because we've chosen a very special set of observables or whether there is something more than that. I, I mean, to the best of my knowledge, the status is very unclear. And showing concrete examples, which I say is empirically working, I should try to explain various scenarios on how it can be working at all, actually at the end of lecture three, or maybe if there's some question or discussion. In, in, in suitable chance, I'll try to address something, even if I'm not, I don't think I can give a definite assessment about the conclusion. Okay. So when did I start, by the way? Okay, so 10 more minutes or so. Like that. Okay. okay, in the remaining time I have, I'll try to warm up with uh, some discussion with the maximal superyang mills, which will somehow be important for the next two lectures. Especially, it's briefly introducing to you some aspects of the solitonic factors of five dimensional superyang mills. Okay? So, five dimensional superyang mills with arbitrary gauge group, especially to interest to us is ADE, have gauge fields, fermions, and also five scalars, probing the transverse direction with the D4 brain. And it's important, important to understand some particle spectrum of this theory. Firstly, in the case where all the scalars are zero in the symmetric phase, you have massless W boson particles and superconductors. And also, as I said, there's some instantonic particles. And it's somewhat interesting for various reasons, conceptually, technically, to consider the spectrum of particles in the, the Coulomb phase, where scalars are expecting, assuming non-zero expectation value as well. So for instance, giving one of the five scalars non-zero expectation value, you get to the Coulomb phase. And the massive VPS spectrum consists of, firstly, the W boson, nothing but the open string suspended between these four. And the instanton particle also survived to exist, although its nature somewhat changes in the Coulomb phase. Okay. Each of them are half VPS. And you can even form a bound state of these two, bound state of W boson and instanton, which in the M5 brain setting should be uplifting to, firstly, the self dual string. It's an M2 brain configuration which wraps the M5 brain, M5 brain circle direction, giving rise to fundamental strings. And the bound states of W bosons with instanton should uplift the self dual strings carrying non-zero colors applying momentum on it. So if you understand this bound state very explicitly, you're going to learn something non-trivial about the two zero theory. It's about this tension for spectrum in Coulomb phase. And these bound states, I mean, if you do the same energetic considerations, you can also show that the energy carrying W boson charge and instanton charge is given by the sum, sum of the instanton particle's mass and the W boson's mass. So these are, again, marginal bound states. I mean, bound states of W bosons and instantons having zero binding energy. So it's extremely subtle kind of bound state. But exactly this kind of bound state has been studied by the necrosoft partition function for instantons, which I'll try to explain to you in the next, next lecture tomorrow. Uh -huh. Oh, KK mode, KK mode. W boson uplift to self I mean, fundamental strings uplift to M2 brains wrapping M theory circle. Yes. So it's just giving you the study of VPS partition functions more richer, having self dual strings in the Coulomb phase. <coughs> and, and, and not just, not just the physics in Coulomb phase, I mean, the partition function studied by Necrosoft in the Coulomb phase is also an important building block or auxiliary object, which frequently appears in the uh, symmetric or conformal phase observables as a building block in the partition function and so on. So this is important for various reasons. So it's most important to emphasize some properties of Young-Mills instantons. Uh, 
the most important property I'm going to emphasize is that the self-dual instantons come with moduli, the parameters in the solution space. That can be easily analyzed by studying the linearized self-duality condition and using suitable acquiescing index theorem. For UN gauge theory with K instantons, you already find that there are four and K number of real moduli. And there are four Munich zero modes as well coming from the four Munich fields. And so the low energy approximation is given by, of, of these solitonic particles is given by what is called the modular space approximation, yielding you some quantum mechanical systems whose target space is given by the instant of modular space. Okay? So if you do the careful modular space approximation where the instant of particle velocity is much smaller than its rest mass, you get a quantum mechanics system uh, where x's are the coordinates of the modular space, so you get a, some kind of supersymmetric sigma model. And strictly speaking, this kind of quantum mechanical description is valid in the limit where the velocity is much smaller than the rest mass, something like the dl 6 and so on. So the strict region of applicability of this quantum mechanics is very limited. You have always have to take a scaling limit where the energy scale of your interest is much smaller than the kaluza klein mass scale and so on. However, if your interest is some kind of DPS observables or so on, the applicability of this quantum mechanics becomes much more wider. A typical example is the Necrosov partition function of five-dimensional gauge theory on R4 times S1 with what is called the omega deformation, which I'll briefly explain to you later. So what Necrosov originally considered for five-dimensional gauge theory is a five-dimensional this five-dimensional gauge theory cancels between bosons and fermions, leaving you to do just a quantum mechanical path integral on the instant of moduli space. So this is another context in which this quantum mechanics is, will turn out to be important, far beyond its honest regime of validity, if you re, because you restrict your observable to somewhat special things. So you have to understand it in strictly context. So good. Uh, I'll, so, so I'll just briefly introduce two a couple of aspects of this instant of moduli space dynamics. I tried to explain everything in the previous slide in context of the field theory solitons approximation. But of course, there's a string theory realization. I already told you that the D0, D4 brain quantum mechanics, preserving eight supersymmetries unbroken by the system, is providing you some quantum mechanical description for the D0 brains or instantons. So, so I told you that this kind of quantum mechanics is describing with 9k by k matrix and some number of k by n matrix. And there are two kinds of important deformation that will be important for us in, for later studies. One is introduced in coulomb Ve for the five-dimensional field theory, exactly what I explained to you in the previous slide. And this turns out to provide, coulomb Ve V, turns out to provide extra potentials on the moduli space. It changes the vacuum structure while leaving the UV theory the same. Another important deformation that will be technically important for our studies is to turn on the fire Heliopoulos deformation in quantum mechanics for the UK gauge symmetry. So physically, this turns out to be turning on some non-commutative deformation on the field theory living on spatial R4. So in type 2A string theory, you have nouvelle schwarz beam in your field. So you turn on constant value of it, satisfying some anti self duality condition. So these are all constant. And there are two prim three parameters of this sort that you can turn on, which, which exactly maps in quantum mechanics to the three kind of uh, fire Heliopoulos term parameter deformation you can turn on. In order to get to the instant on quantum mechanics that I explained to you in the previous slide, you have to decouple the bulk mode for the D0 brains escaping out of D4 brains. This can be achieved in two different ways. Either you can set the quantum mechanical constant, coupling constant to be infinite, decoupling these two sectors. Or you can take this fire yellow plus term to be very large. Both deformation turns out to give large mass to the bulk degrees of freedom when you study the physics of the instantons, I mean, D0 brains stuck to the D4 brains. I mean, more technically, this quantum mechanics is decomposed into Higgs and Coulomb branch, which interact in general setting. But when either of the two parameters are tend to be large, the, the, the bulk degrees of freedom corresponding to the Coulomb branch acquires large mass and decouple out of the physics. And in this Higgs branch physics, the low, low energy quantum mechanics that you get is the previous supersymmetric sigma model on the instant of moduli space. Yes, yes, please. Yes. Yes, which is the five And what was the other? Oh, so, so, so we have the five dimensional theory or six dimensional theory. 
it's going to the full of phase of the field. Yeah, yeah. So if you're in the full of phase, all the the, the Higgs branch degrees of freedom acquires extra masses and the dynamic spins. Hmm. Yeah. In a special limit. I mean the D zero brains which are not bound to D four. This, this, this. Yes, yes. Uh, zero zero strings in, roughly speaking, in a particular direction, going moving out of the five transverse direction. So it, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this system, as it is, describes a bulk brain system coupling to each other. The six dimensional field theory is our ultimate interest, so we want to decouple them out. Let me give, a, give you a final comment, which will turn out to be somewhat important before I finish. If you investigate the sigma model that I briefly explained to you, all you have, I mean, mo the most important thing you have to do, understand is the moduli space metric on the internal moduli space. It has a very peculiar structure, which will turn out to be conceptually important. Some puzzling aspects are still unresolved nowadays. And that comes with the following, as, I mean, to simplify this discussion, let me just con consider a single internal moduli space for the UN gate theory. The moduli space decomposes into a different parts with the following metric. Firstly, it has the four-dimensional part, which is nothing but the center of mass position moduli for the instant particle. It's due to momentum conservation, it, this part decouples out. Okay? And the really funny part is that the instant one has a scale modulus given by a real number lambda. Okay? So the, it's not strange that composite particle has some non-zero sizes. But the strange thing is that in the case of instantons, the size parameter is a free parameter. You can have instantons with large size or small size. By size, I mean whether the energy densities are significantly localized on. And the rest of the degrees of freedom, I mean moduli, has to do with how you embed your instanton solutions in the gauge orientation space. So really important part is this instanton size. And the interpretation of this instanton size, I mean instantons, are very subtle when it gets to large instantons or small instantons with different physical consequences. So first of all, the large instanton region is very strange because it's some internal degree of freedom, because it's, but it, since this can go to infinity, it will give you some continuum spectrum coming from internal degrees. It's very strange. Okay? So the correct interpretation of this, to the best of our knowledge, my knowledge, is not clarified yet, especially in the context of six-dimensional CFT physics, but it's believed that this large instanton size causing some subtle infrared problem issues will have to do with the infrared physics of the six dimensional CFT reflected into five dimensional Young Meson instantons. This is the rough idea, but I don't think it has been really clarified at the moment. So the observables that are study are mostly those which are insensitive to infrared issues or the cases in which I can set up an observable which is free of these infrared pro problems. So due to the lack of time, I'll explain these details later. And the final thing is that the small instanton region is very, very funny. Because this, this, this internal part of the moduli space develops a cone geometry. And when, the, when lambda is 0, the moduli space metric is singular. So the moduli space dynamics in terms of quantum mechanics becomes incomplete. And presumably, you need more UV input than the naive five-dimensional super young theory. This, I think, is the part where you need really something more than five young mills. So for instance, you can deform this six-dimensional two-zero theory and so on in the UV, let's say by turning on some very large non-commutativity background and so on. So it deforms the UV theory, but it's expected to leave the infrared theory, especially the five young mills, uh, unaffected. So this plays the important role of resolving or, or making smoothing, smoothening out the tip of, the, this, or before, of, of this cone geometry. For instance, for the U2 theory, the single instant of moduli space in the relative part is R4 modified out by Z2, turning on non-commutative deformation, or Fi parameter, smoothens out the, out the singularity at the tip to the well-known eguchi hansen metric so that you can do a, do a consistent quantum calculation here. This will be some technically important aspect for further calculation. Okay, so, so let me finish. Sorry for going over time.